We come to chapter 2 this morning in Mark. As you know, we're um, going through the book of Mark throughout this entire year. And a couple of weeks ago, Markham started off um, in chapter 1, and we saw how Mark, in his enthusiastic and uh, action-packed account of the person of Jesus, made it very clear to us that he was not only good news, but Jesus was the best news ever. Lots of things are good news Um, But Jesus, who came from heaven, who was born as a baby, who lived and walked among us, who was crucified and resurrected and ascended into heaven, he is the best news that a human being could ever wish to receive. And last week, we saw how Jesus was anointed by God and then sent out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, and yet he did not sin, tempted in every way that we are but he did not sin. And so this morning, we're going to be moving into a different phase, if you like, a a theme for over the next four weeks, looking at the um, various demonstrations of authority that Jesus has on earth. It would be good if you had a Bible in front of you. Um, If you haven't, there are stewards who are about to walk up and down with a Bible um, so that you can have the words in front of you. That would be good. Um, While you're doing that and finding Mark chapter 2, I want to just read you something to ponder on before I get into the main bit of the scripture. If our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been for physical healing, God would have sent us a doctor. If our greatest need was for uh, for emotional healing, God would have sent us a psychologist. If the world's greatest need had been for good government, God would have sent us a politician. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a saviour. He sent us Jesus. His name will be called Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. Let's read together Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is one of those passages that if you've been reading the Bible for any length of time, or if you've been through Sunday school, you will be familiar with this story. It's quite dramatic. And um, I've often said from here, it's, it's really important that if we're to understand a piece of scripture, we really need to understand the context in which it was spoken. And there's two things that we need to understand in this passage. The first thing 
is not so important, but it helps. You know, I heard this as a child. And you see, a house, to me, as a child, was a brick building, two stories, with a pointed, slated roof. So how on earth did four men get a man on a stretcher up onto the roof, come down through the roof, down through the loft, down through my parents' bedroom, down to the downstairs, where it would all be happening? It made no sense. But of course, the houses were very different in those days. This house was probably one story. It would have had a staircase on the outside of the building, and the roof would have been made of earth and straw. So that makes a lot more sense. And so when we understand that, we can get it. And we also need to understand the, the culture of the day. What were people thinking? What were people believing? What did they understand? What did they know in here? And when we understand that, it makes more sense of the passage in general. <coughs> and by the time we get to this event in Jesus' ministry, the people have already seen demonstrations of Jesus' authority. They've already seen Jesus teaching with authority. You know, anyone can learn stuff from a book and then stand up and tell people. But Jesus, he teaches with authority. He knows what he's doing. And they can see that. They see the difference. He's already um, shown his authority in the spirit realm by, car uh, by um, casting out an unclean spirit from a man. So we've seen that. And he's also shown his authority over sickness. He's healed Simon's mother-in-law. All this is in chapter 1. And these areas of authority we will be looking at in greater depth in the coming weeks. But it's no wonder then that by the time we get to this story, it's little wonder that news about Jesus has spread fast and people are flocking to see him. And here we have these four friends with this unfortunate soul who's paralyzed. And they've heard about Jesus they have faith and high expectation that Jesus will be able to heal their friend, so much so that they are determined to get him to Jesus by every means possible. There's a lot we don't know about this event. Were they Jews or Gentiles? We don't know. They were probably Jews because Capernaum was a Jewish place. Did the paralyzed man have any faith? Or was it just the friends? We don't know that either. Did the paralyzed man want to come to Jesus? Or was it just his friends? We don't know. But what we do know is that when he was lowered in front of Jesus, Jesus gave him what he needed. And it's obvious that these men had gone to a lot of trouble to get this man to the feet of Jesus. And Jesus saw their Faith, And I was quite encouraged and excited about that. You see, when we make an effort to bring people to Jesus, when we have faith that if we bring people to Jesus, Jesus will meet with them, Jesus sees that. And I think we should be encouraged by that. God honors us as we bring people to Jesus. I, I, that's quite exciting, don't you? But I paused here. And I ask myself a question, how much effort am I prepared to put in to bringing people to Jesus? You see, these four friends, they heard that Jesus was there, they picked up their friend, they took him, and then they found a crowd. It was hopeless, it was impossible, there was too many obstacles in the way. They couldn't get to Jesus because of all the people. But they persevered, they found a way round. And sometimes I think when we want to bring someone to Jesus, we start off with great intention, but then we come against an obstacle. And what do we do? Do we say, oh, this is too hard, this is too complicated, it'll never work, we're never going to get through all this. And we turn back. But we need to be persistent and take encouragement and inspiration from these men and how high is our expectation, if we're honest, that Jesus really will meet the needs of the people we bring to him? These are questions that I asked myself, and maybe you would ask yourself the same questions. We might not know anyone who is physically paralyzed, but we all know people 
who are emotionally and spiritually paralyzed. A spiritually paralyzed man cannot take himself to Jesus any more than a physically paralyzed man can walk. What do I mean by that? If we look at Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, Once you were dead in your sins because of your disobedience. Well, a dead man cannot walk to Jesus. He cannot take himself to Jesus. He has to be taken. And we were all dead in our sins once. And we didn't get ourselves to Jesus. Somebody took us to Jesus. And I will be eternally grateful, literally, for the people who took me to Jesus. We take them in prayer. We offer them an invitation to an event. We reach out a hand to help them and to walk with them and bring them to the feet of Jesus. They cannot bring themselves. So what can my response be? As someone who was brought to the feet of Jesus, and Jesus changed my life and took me from being spiritually dead and paralyzed and helpless into someone who was alive by his spirit, what can my response be other than to say, I want to bring other people to experience Jesus. I am a Christian. I'm sure you'll be glad to know that. But I realized as I read this passage, I, I'm very different to Jesus. And should I be? You see, I wouldn't have done it like Jesus did it here in this passage. If I'd had all the authority that Jesus has, and somebody brought to me a paralyzed man, I would see a paralyzed man. And everything in me would want to heal the paralysis and say, get up and walk, and that would be it. That's what I would want to do. But this doesn't seem to be what Jesus sees first. He doesn't address the presenting problem first. If someone came to me who was grieving the, the loss of their wife, everything in me would want to raise the wife from the dead to take away the grief of the man. Or if someone came who was homeless or m had no money or had no food and was in desperate straits, I would want to fix all that. I think the last thing I would do is address the fact that they need their sins forgiving. I'm very different. And maybe you are as well. But in this passage, Jesus sees not only a paralyzed man at the mercy of his friend's charity, he sees what the man really needs most of all, that his sins could be forgiven. Why is that? I think there are several reasons. One, here... Jesus is extending his authority. I say, in chapter 1, we've already seen his authority in teaching, his authority over the spiritual realm, and his authority over physical sickness. And that's amazing. But now, it gets even more. He has the authority to forgive sins. Secondly, Jesus here, by doing this, is making a claim about himself that is unique. Everybody in that room knows that only God can forgive sins. And yet here is this Jesus, this man, this teacher, essentially claiming the authority of God himself. If it were not true, then that would be total blasphemy. And this is where it helps if we understand the, the culture, because then we get an idea of the impact that this would have, just as much as we need to understand the structure of the house in order for it to make sense. We grasp that the, what, what, what is happening here is huge. And finally, Jesus sees what this man really needs. And what he really needs is not necessarily what his friends think he needs, when Jesus looks at us, he sees what we really need. And what we think we need, and what Jesus knows we need, isn't necessarily the same thing. I wonder what the man's reaction was. 
Was he overwhelmed with relief? It's like, wow, my sins are forgiven. Did he expect to be physically healed? The understanding then was very much that sickness was as a result of sin. So the fact that Jesus had um, forgiven his sins, would he have expected to be suddenly healed? We don't know. Did he look at Jesus and think, whoa, this is blasphemous? Was it one of indignation? I think indignation would be a very Western idea. It would be a a very Western response. You know, I'm a paralyzed man. I need physical healing. Who are you to tell me my sins need forgiving? We wouldn't like that, would we? Because we see the presenting problem and we don't necessarily see the real issue. And we come to this event with the benefit of 2,000 years of experience of Jesus' resurrected life. But when this is happening, when this event is being played out, Jesus was just a teacher who had shown that he can do miracles. And wasn't he supposed to be gentle and kind and compassionate and heal the sick? Isn't what these men had heard Well, yes, Jesus is gentle and kind and compassionate. And yes, he does still heal the sick. But it's not just about healing. And what we see here, when Jesus heals the man, is God vindicating his claim to have the authority to forgive sins. God heals the man through Jesus, vindicating his unique claim There's a myriad of opinion out there in the world when it comes to the relation between sickness and sin. If we go back to the very beginning when God created the world and men and women, there was no sickness, there was no death, there was no sin. It's only when mankind decided to do it their own way and turn away from God that sin and sickness and death entered the picture. So in that sense, yes, all sickness is a direct result from sin in that sense. But we have to be very careful, and it's often unhelpful, to make it quite so black and white now, now that we've come a very long way from the beginning. We only have to look around us to see that there are men and women who are deliberately and blatantly and flagrantly living their lives in every way against God, and yet they go on to live very long and healthy lives. And there are other people who have loved God and served God with all their strength and all humility all of their lives, and they suffer physically. And we struggle with that, if we're honest. Because we have this mindset that says people don't deserve that, that bad things shouldn't happen to good people, but life is not like that. And actually, when we think about it, God does not give us what we deserve. And I thank God that he doesn't. But whatever opinions there are out there, this one thing is true. We all need forgiveness. We do not all need physical healing. Why is forgiveness so important? Firstly, it matters to God. It matters to God because God is a holy God, and we as sinful men and women cannot be in his presence, but he wants us in his presence. Uh, But he is a just God, and so sin has to be dealt with. It can't just be ignored. And secondly, it's important because we can't undo the past. If we look back over our lives, I'm sure we could all think of at least one thing that we so wish we hadn't done. We knew we shouldn't do it, we went ahead and we did it anyway, and now we are filled with remorse and regret And we can't undo the past. We can go to people that we've wronged and we can seek reconciliation and we can ask for their forgiveness and we can try and make amends. And it's right and good that we do that. But actually, there is still unfinished business. Let me read you some of Psalm 51. This was written by King David after he had had an affair with Bathsheba. 
and arranged for her husband to be killed on the front line of battle. That is pretty low. And he says this to God, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. He knows what he's done. And then he says this, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You see, when we sin against other people, we sin against God. We sin against God, but Jesus has the authority to forgive us our sins. And he has that authority because he is the one who gave his pure, sinless blood as an offering for all time, for all people, to enable us to be reconciled with God and be forgiven. Sin against God is a serious matter. It's not something that can be swept under the carpet and ignored. Sin has to be dealt with. And throughout the history of God's people, throughout all of the Old Testament, sin is dealt with through the shedding of blood. Usually it was a lamb or a goat. When anyone came to God for forgiveness of sin, an animal was slaughtered, and that shed blood of the animal atoned for the sin. Hebrews 9.22 says this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So the people who were sat listening to Jesus in that overcrowded house in Capernaum would have understood two things. Firstly, only God can forgive sin. Secondly, only by sacrificing and shedding blood would those sins be forgiven. So what a shock, what an outrageous thing to say when Jesus, this man, this teacher, has the audacity to say, son, your sins are forgiven. No one could do that except God, but Jesus did it. But where's the shed blood? Where's the sacrifice? Where's the atonement? Jesus is the one who has the authority to forgive us because he himself was not only God incarnate, but because he came and shed his own blood, he paid the price for our forgiveness. In John's Gospel, we see John the Baptist, when he was baptizing people in the River Jordan, he sees Jesus, and what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not only God incarnate, but the sacrificial lamb that we could be forgiven through. I've read this passage through and through and through. And I sense that Jesus forgives the sin first because that is the most important thing. And I wondered, if no one had spoken up, would Jesus have gone on to heal the man physically? Because it was only in response to the teachers of the law, when they questioned his authority, that Jesus then physically heals the man. It's secondary. The most important is the forgiveness. Now, one day, this body will get sick and die. Cheery thought. I might go to Jesus myself, I might be carried to Jesus by others, but one day it will die and I will stand before God. On that day when I stand before God, what will I need most? At that point, we won't need a healthy body. We won't need money. We won't need a career behind us. We won't need education. We won't need family or friends or a home or any of those things that we strive so hard to get. On that day, all we will need is God's forgiveness. And we have that in Jesus Christ. We have all we need in Jesus. You know, this passage is not primarily about healing. 
It's not primarily a discussion point between the relationship between sickness and sin. This is about the authority that only Jesus has to redeem us. He is our only hope. He is our saviour. So when we look at our friends and our family and our neighbours, what do we see? Do we just see paralysed men and women who we want to fix? How do we pray for them? Are we tempted to pray, oh Lord, give them health, give them wealth, give them prosperity, give them happiness, give them wisdom? Shouldn't our prayer be, Lord, will you lead them by your spirit to the feet of Jesus that he might forgive their sins? If we have accepted Jesus our saviour ourselves, and most of us here would have done that, we have nothing to fear. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has done it. Jesus has dealt with it. In him, we have all that we truly need. But if you're here this morning and you have never asked Jesus for forgiveness, then can I urge you to do that now? Or if you're watching online and you have never realized that the thing you need most of all is forgiveness, then ask for it now. This passage is a wonderful picture of what Jesus can do with a paralyzed human being. He takes us in our paralyzed state. We come to him, he meets with us, he forgives us our sins and he sends us on as we rejoice in God for what he has done. Jesus is the only way that we can have our burden of sin lifted from us. We cannot undo the past, but the burden of that can be lifted because of what Jesus has done. He is the authority. He is the only name under heaven by which man can be saved. And in receiving that gift of salvation from Jesus, we enter into new life, a new life with purpose and meaning and an eternal perspective. For those of us who know Jesus, I, I want us to be re, um, re-envisioned, re-impassioned, re-enthused about the reality that Jesus sees us when we try and bring people to him. I want us to leave this place this morning feeling inspired to go and be like these four friends that didn't give up at the first obstacle, but actually found a way to bring their friend to Jesus. I want us to be renewed with expectation that Jesus will meet with people when we bring them to him. So as we go out into this week, have that in mind. Have those four faithful friends in mind. Who are the paralyzed people around you? Who are those people that need to know above all else that what they need is Jesus' forgiveness? And be encouraged. Go for it. Be inspired. Step out in faith with the amazing reality that Jesus sees that faith that you have.